can search the depths of me and love me to the core. And who controls the world I see? Thank you for worshiping with Valley View Online. I am so glad that you're here. Our prayer is that you can actively participate while doing church online. Sing along with worship, take communion, and pray with us. You are invited to connect with our staff. Comment in the chat if you're watching live or send us a text at 972-245-8822 and a member of our team will be in touch with you. Valley View's vision is to love Dallas, live free, and lead others, and there are plenty of ways for you to join in. Find upcoming events at vvcc.org events or download the Church Center app for easy access to online giving, Bible study registrations, and more. While we are so thankful for the technology that allows us to share this service with you online, our prayer is that you will be able to join us in person soon. We all need a safe and loving community to grow in our faith together. We can't wait to see you on campus. Have a great morning. was younger there was a show on TV called MacGyver when he'd get himself into some really rough situations and I don't know how he did it but he figured out ways to get out of the situation by using things like duct tape I don't know about you but sometimes as a parent running our kids around to choir practices soccer practices baseball things work the situations come up and we just want to do whatever it takes to just get through that moment we just want to kind of put some duct tape on it. It's a temporary fix to just kind of get us through, but it's not good long term. And so I want to invite you to an equip class that we'll be having the first three Sundays in August, August 7th, 14th, and 21st at 9 a.m. And we're going to be talking about intentional parenting, discipline, laughing with your kids, creating memory with your kids. We'll have a video that we'll be watching and then we'll be discussing in small groups some of the things that we're talking about, just sharing group wisdom together.
morning, church. Let's stand and worship this morning.
praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God. Scripture together, she's going to uh, read along with us. Um, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with, sorry, with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ through through it. It's too great uh, to understand fully. Though it is, I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty work and mighty power at work within us to accomplish inf infinitely more than we may ask or think. Glory to him in the church, in Christ Jesus, through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We're about to sing this song called, You Keep Hope Alive. We have hope in Christ. That's going to continue his hope. And we get to celebrate that. We get to actually sing that. There are some people here, in me, and y'all may like, have given up. Y'all may have given up on life. Y'all may have given up on the hope that Christ has. But we can declare that if we are believing in him, that we still have that hope. And we can testify of that. And so we're going to do that this morning. So let's sing together.
Hallelujah. We believe that this morning, church, that our God keeps hope alive. Let's pray together. Father, you are that living hope. You are the God that says that there is hope in the morning, that there is hope no matter what the circumstance may be. We believe in a God who is a living hope, a God whose promises are always yes and amen. And Father, today we just know that there is hope in this house. There is hope in our lives. There is hope in our struggles. There is hope in our sickness. Father, there is hope in our lives because you are alive in all of us in here. So Father, we glorify you. We lift up your name in this place. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you. If you haven't noticed, it's summer in Texas, which means it's hot, but you couldn't have picked a better place to be. It's a cool spot, right? This is the place you ought to spend your Sunday morning. So we're glad you're here. Folks online, good to see you. Glad you're with us. Um, please say hi in the chat. We'd love to say hi to you. Folks back there would love to hear from you. You know, and if this is your first time, we're really glad you're here. You picked a good spot to be here. You'll find a card in front of you that says, welcome home. We mean that, and we want you to know how glad we are you came. If you'd fill it out and drop it off at the new home table outside, they have a gift for you. Um, you know, we can also go online, vbcc.org, fill it out um, online, super easy. We just want to make sure we knew you came and want to say hi to you. Hey, I want to share this verse with you as we continue worship with our offering. This is from Proverbs 11, 24 through 25. It says this, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. What a beautiful verse, right? You know, God gives us this opportunity every week to be generous with what he's given us. I think he wants to remind us of his overwhelming generosity to us, that he's the one that refreshes us every day. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for refreshing us. Thank you for this opportunity. You can give online at vbcc.org backslash give, or you can go to the church app and do it that way, or you can pull out currency, a check, whatever you got, there's donation boxes as you leave. Remember his generosity. You know, God gives us this rich palette of emotions to experience life through. We just sang about one that I think is the most powerful, love. You know, our family experienced the emotion of love in two very different ways over the past 10 days. This past Thursday, our son and daughter-in-law welcomed their first child, John Thornton. He's our first, and I can't tell you how excited we are. I don't know if you knew this, but there's actually frequent buyer programs for toys. By my calculation, I should reach the platinum level by next Sunday, at least two programs. Marla doesn't agree, but I don't ever think it's too early to have a big wheel, right? I mean, he's three days old, but he'll grow into it. Can't be too early. Our family also experienced love a week ago from that Thursday in a very different way. That was the day we lost my sister to ovarian cancer. Could not have been more different. But at the heart of both was love. And God was there. God was there, caring for us, loving us. He put this verse on my heart. I want to share with you. You probably heard it. If you haven't, you've seen it in a football game. John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. How amazing is that? God, the Father of our Savior, Jesus, who he loved, loves dearly, loved us so much that he was willing to endure the pain of watching his only son 
go to the cross. How many of us would give up our son and daughter for someone else? It's unbelievable. Jesus loves us so much that he was willing to suffer and die to save us so that we could experience the incredible joy of holding a new baby so that death, so scary, didn't mean it was the end. It's not the end. This morning as we take communion together, we need to remember what Jesus said at that first meal. He wants us to remember his broken body as we eat that way for this morning. He wants us to remember his blood spilt on that cross for us. He also wants us to remember that three days later, he emerged from that tomb and joined his father who loved him in heaven. He wants us to remember that he's got a room saved for us there with him. In the ultimate expression of love, he saved us. Remember those words, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We are forgiven, we are loved, and our hope is in Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Let's pray. Father God, man, at a time in a place that seemed hopeless, on a hill with a cross, a place that was nothing but death. You used that moment to bring hope into this world. Unbelievable. Hope for everyone, for all people who were there, all people to come, for my new grandbaby. And it was through your son, who you love, a son that loved us more than he loved life, who was willing to die and suffer for us. It's more than we can expect. It's more than we could ask, but it's a gift that's given freely. Thank you, God. And Father, this morning we remember your son. We give praise to his name. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for his saving grace. Father, and I pray for anyone in this room that's struggling with loss, that feels hopeless. I pray they see you. I pray they feel your touch. I pray they know that there is hope. His name is Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.
thank you for this opportunity to worship this morning, Lord. We pray that you make us instruments of your peace. And Lord, we pray that you help us to offer hope inside of this world. Help us to build our lives upon you, in Jesus' name. Well, good morning, Valley View. If you would, do me a favor, just turn to somebody and say, hey, it's so good to see you in church today. Would you do that real quick? <laughs> I wish you could hear what that sounds like. Listen, I am so very glad that you are here in person, those of you here and those of you that are joining us online. As John mentioned, it is summertime right? You can tell it just feels like summertime because we have a, an entire section of students that are gone, right? This morning they left, and I, I got to say this, those of you that have been praying for us to get enough spots for campers to go, every child, every student that, got, that wanted to go to camp got to go to camp, God answered prayer. And uh, that, that was an amazing thing to see them take off this morning. I know that uh, Jonah's in over his head for sure, but... Uh, <laughs> It'll be good for him to be there. And, and it is summertime, which means a lot of different things to you. I know you're, you're trying to figure out how to deal with heat. Maybe you're, you're running to go get an icy or something like that. I don't know what your favorite, favorite drink is at this time of year, but I, I know this too, that um, a lot of people are traveling. But summertime in Valley View simply means one thing. It means legends. And every summer we get together, we talk about uh, a couple of Old Testament characters that, that are found in, in God's Word. And, and we, we know this, that God's Word still speaks to us today, even from something like an Old Testament prophet. And uh, last week, Mark, Mark did an incredible job talking about this book, uh, that the grass withers, right? The flower falls, but the Word of the Lord, it, it stands forever. And that was some words from Isaiah the prophet. And we're going to continue taking a look at that. And I heard recently something that was just a little bit concerning to me, so I thought I'd share with you. And, and uh, it, it, had to deal with, it had to deal with the fact that our attention span is somewhat diminishing. Like, <laughs> I hope you stay with me. <laughs> and uh, because I read, I read this statistic, actually, I'll put it up on the screen for you, and that is that in the year 2000, our average attention span was 12.5 or 12 seconds. Fifteen years later, in 2015, 8.25 seconds. And then I went to the next screen, and it simply said this, that a goldfish can has the attention span of nine seconds. <laughs> Which doesn't bode well. So it, 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 that led me to think about this for a moment, that... We're losing our ability to sit still and think. We're losing our ability to, to think and ponder some things, which got me thinking about this one particular thought. What is it that you think about? What do you spend your day thinking about? I had a high school math teacher. Uh, his name was Robert Burns. You can look him up. He's probably no longer in existence, but... Um, he was an upper-level math teacher for me and, uh, in high school. He, he was from Scotland, which meant that every day he wore a kilt to class, which was really strange. And, but he did something else that was pretty strange. He was this great, incredible thinker, one of the best thinkers that I have ever been around in my life because he kept challenging us with this one simple thought, what you think about really matters and, and whenever we would give an incorrect answer, he would say these words, you're not thinking properly. You're not thinking properly. So what he did, he, my, my sophomore year in school, uh, I had him my sophomore, junior, and senior year. He was an incredible math teacher, math leader. And he started every class period with this one five-minute exercise. Everybody put your books down, put everything off your desk. I just need you to sit still, and I need you to think. He had no idea what we were thinking, but I think his goal was to get us to be thinking about math because he loved, loved math so much. But his, his challenge to us was, listen, I just want, to, I just want you to think about, I, I just want you to think on purpose because what you think 
really, really matters. And he, he, he kept telling us this. You can, ch- you can literally change the way that you do think. Because he, thinking is second nature to us. It's like breathing. It's like your heart beating until it no longer is. Your, your thoughts, our thoughts kind of go under the radar. What we think about all day long go under the radar. We, we typically don't pay attention to the things that we think about. And my mother was also one of those people who was constantly challenging the way that I was thinking. And she would always ask me this one simple question, Joe, what in the world were you thinking when you did that? What were you thinking? I, I know that we incorrectly think that we, we cannot control our thoughts. But we can choose where we set our mind. It is possible. Science shows us that we can only think about one thing at a time. So why not, why not be purposeful and, and choose, choose to fix your thoughts this morning on Jesus? I don't know if you've ever just sat down and thought about Jesus, but that's my challenge to you today. As we kind of walk through this morning, just, just if I could do if I could just have you walk out of here thinking about Jesus this morning, that, w- that would be an incredible thought. I- I'm reminded of a-, a children's song that maybe you've heard it, maybe, you- maybe you'd see it more as a poem, but it simply goes this way. It shouldn't be hard to sit very still and think about Jesus, his cross on a hill, and all that he suffered and he did for me. It shouldn't be hard for, y- for me to sit quietly. It shouldn't be hard, even though I am small, to think about Jesus. Not hard at all. Isaiah was a prophet from God. He was a prophet from God during a very tumultuous time of life, during a very tumultuous season for for God's people. And he, and he, he had a message from God to give to God's people. And, and you can read his messages his thoughts, his, the things that God was revealing to him, his prophecies that God was giving to his people through Isaiah in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And, and we've been telling you this for the last couple of weeks, that there are two basic, I, I don't know if you know that much about Isaiah, but Isaiah has two basic themes to it, the book, the Old Testament book. And the, and the first is this, is that is that you need to trust in the Holy One of Israel. You, you just need to trust in God. In the, in the plan, you, you need to wait upon the Lord for God's plan to come true. You need to trust in the plan of God. Now, that is very, very hard to do. And that was one of the messages that Isaiah gave to God's people. The second one was this. Hey, a Messiah is coming. A, a Messiah is coming. A Messiah will come. And Isaiah's intent would, was to draw the mind of people just to get them to think about this Messiah that would come. Now, if I were to ask you just to take a moment and just think about Jesus, Isaiah may not be the first place that you, you would think of when it comes to thinking about Jesus. Maybe, though, what I want to t- challenge you with is perhaps the richest chapter in all of the Bible. That's a big statement. Perhaps the richest chapter in all of the Bible is Isaiah 53. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 53. We'll, we'll get there in just a moment. And I know what a lot of you are thinking. If I'm going to think about Jesus, I'm going to run. Those of you that are believers, those of you that are Christians already, you're, you're, probably, going to, you're probably going to try to turn to one of the, the gospels that talk about Jesus. Like, you think that the first gospel is actually Matthew, and then Mark is the second gospel, Luke, then John. But, but can, I, I want to challenge that way of thinking this morning and, and let you know, maybe that perhaps the very first gospel in all of your Bible is Isaiah chapter 53. Because this is what a gospel is. A gospel is this divinely inspired book or chapter or page, words on a page that tell the story of Jesus. And the, the first divinely inspired revelation that comes from heaven that tells the full story of Jesus is Isaiah 53. It's, it's the most complete and the most profound um, revelation 
that we have on the work of salvation, what it takes to be saved. Martin Luther said this about Isaiah 53. That he said this, every Christian should memorize these 12 verses. Every Christian should memorize it. That's something for you to think about. That's a challenge I'm putting on your plate. You should think about memorizing Isaiah 53. Because Isaiah 53 is filled, it's filled with gospel language. Those words that we should be talking to other people about when it comes to salvation, when it comes to being in the eyes of God righteous. Words like atonement and sacrifice and, and substitute and redemption, all of, all of those kinds of words are, are explained in Isaiah 53. Isaiah's prophecies and his predictions in this chapter are so complete and so complex and so precise that God, only God could have known about them seven centuries before they happened. 700 years. It's the most comprehensive explanation of the cross in the Bible. And it's in the Old Testament. And the cross was 700 years in the future. Matter of fact, the New Testament writers, they, they refer to almost every single line in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 spans from eternity past. Like, think about that. No end in the past to eternity future. No end in the future. It, it covers a tremendous amount of ground. It, it covers everything from the incarnation of Jesus, when Jesus becomes a man in the form of a baby, to the point where Jesus is then humiliated and rejected and put on trial, is convicted, is executed, is then buried, is then risen from the dead. And then he ascends into heaven, and then he is exalted as, as the Savior. It, it's all here in this one chapter. And if the New Testament epistles, think about this, if the New Testament epistles were lost, somehow we lost them, we, we would still have sufficient explanation to the good news of Jesus from this one simple chapter in order to help save people, save sinners from an eternal destination. Isaiah is incredible in how he crafts. He uses this metaphor uh, to describe this Messiah that's coming in his book. He uses the metaphor of a servant. At the end of chapter 52 and then into chapter 53, which is the... They're the it's the most significant chapter about the Messiah that we have. A, a lot, what I'm basically telling you is that a lot hinges on what we're about to read. A lot. And, and here's something I, I just, it's kind of profound. It's kind of neat to me. I, I, I like this kind of stuff. There, there are literally two divisions in, in Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah. There are 39 chapters of judgment, and there are 27 chapters of salvation. Those two numbers should ring in your ears if, you're, uh, if you've studied your Bible at all. Because those two numbers, 39 chapters of judgment, 27 chapters of salvation, 39 chapters is the same number that the Old Testament books have. Are 27 New Testament books. The, the book of Isaiah parallels the Bible. Ma matter of fact, the, the, final, the final 27 chapters that talk about salvation, the final 27 chapters from chapters 40 to 66, they each have, there, there's three divisions there. Three divisions of nine chapters. Nine chapters on the salvation of Israel. Nine chapters on the salvation of sinners. Nine chapters on the salvation of the universe or the world. The, the, the middle chapter, think about this, the, if you're still with me. The middle chapter of that middle nine chapters where it's talking about sa saving sinners, guess which chapter that is? 53. If you go to the middle verse in the middle chapter of Isaiah 53, it's verse 6. You'll know it. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us hath turned to our own way. And the, the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all, the sins 
of us all. The book of Isaiah, basically the book of Isaiah is just funneling, funneling, funneling down, 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 down to verse 6. And then it folds. This chapter, Isaiah 53, answers one of the, the most critical questions of all questions that any human being could ever ask. And I don't know about you, but I've asked a lot of questions in my day. But the most important question that I could ever ask, that you will ever ask, that anyone will ever ask is this. How can a sinner be made right with God? That's the most important question anyone can ask. And every religion in the world, outside of Jesus, has the wrong answer. How is one made right with God is answered in Isaiah 53. It, it also answers, it also solves one of the, the Old Testament, it, it solves one of the major riddles that, are, that exist in the Old Testament. Maybe you didn't know there was a riddle in the Old Testament. It's found in Exodus chapter 34. When, when it says this in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, the Lord passed by Moses, right in front of Moses, proclaiming this, this is God speaking. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, uh, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands of people, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. In other words, the love that John was talking about earlier, God's covenant love, his abiding love, his sacrificial love, his salvi- saving love or salvation love, that, that's just the first part of the riddle. This Lord who's compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, he abounds in love. He's committed his love to thousands of people. God loves everyone. Don't get, don't get us wrong. He forgives the iniquities, the transgressions, and the sins of people. But here's the second part of the riddle. Yet it says, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. That's the riddle of the Old Testament. That how can, I, how can God forgive and love and show grace and show compassion and yet punish at the same time? It's a riddle that's answered in Isaiah 53. Because that trips up more people. Most people, a lot of people believe that God, God loves me. But there's a second part to that. And as we read it this morning, you you know this. Those of you that have read this chapter before understand this chapter a little bit. Clearly, you'll identify the fact that it's referring to the Messiah as being Jesus, the Lord Jesus. But, But it's not just a, I don't want you to, it's not just a prophecy about Jesus. It like most people will read it and say, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely talking about Jesus because it, it was written and spoken about this future, that, this coming Messiah that's supposed to come. He's not here yet, but he's going he's gonna to do some things in the future for us. And while, while that's true, it essentially lays that out. That's, that's not the only purpose of this chapter. H- how do I know that? Because as we read it, the verbs are in the past tense. You, you may not think about that, but I do. It says this, he, he was, words like, the verbs like, he, he was despised and he was, he carried our sorrows. He was stricken, he was smitten, he was afflicted, he was pierced, he, he was crushed. Those, those verbs are all past tense. Like, somebody is not, Isaiah is saying, basically, somebody's not looking forward to the cross, What's happening is that that somebody is now looking back on the cross. Don't miss that. That 700 years before the Messiah comes, we have a prophecy of somebody who's on the other side of the cross looking back at the cross, at the Messiah. So, So this isn't just a prophecy about Jesus. This is about a prophecy of someone looking back at the cross. In fact, it's not just a person. It's the, the pronouns are, are plural. 
It's a, a group of people who are in the future looking back at the cross and they're, they're thinking about Jesus. They're, they're thinking about Jesus. And this is what they say. Yeah, he was the Messiah. This is the Messiah that, that suffered for us. So we have this group of people who final, finally come to the realization that this Jesus whom they rejected, not, not just them, but generations of people have rejected the Messiah. And as they look back over history, they look at this one that they rejected, and this is what they say. Isaiah 53 Verse 1 says this. This group of people looking back. Who, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, who, who believed the report that we heard? We didn't believe it. We, we didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. We didn't believe it when Jesus said it. Like for generations and generations and generations, people didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. We, we didn't believe what the apostles said. We didn't believe what preachers in the early church said. We, we didn't believe it. We didn't believe it. We didn't believe it. Generations of people have chosen not to believe. And listen, it, they say this. It wasn't just that, that we didn't believe the words. It says this, the arm of the Lord was revealed. The arm of the Lord is just... Uh, uh, an expression of the power of, the, of God. God. God's plan was also revealed through the, through the power of Jesus, and we didn't believe it. G Jesus spent time healing every unimaginable disease and raising people from the dead and controlling the elements of nature. Jesus actually created food to meet the needs of the people around him, but we didn't accept him. Even when we saw his power being demonstrated through the armor of the Lord. But they asked that question, who, who did accept it? Who did acknowledge it? The, the message came. But who, who received it? Here's just a word of advice, maybe a word of caution. Maybe it's a life lesson for all of us in this room. And that is this, is that repentance always begins with this confession. Admittance always begins with this confession. I rejected the Savior. For you to be made right with God, it starts with you recognizing where you stand with him. And that's not just true for the Jewish people who didn't listen to the message of Jesus. That's true for every one of us in this room and everybody listening online. Why, why did they reject Jesus? Well, ver verse 2 kind of answers that question. Isaiah is going to paint this picture of Jesus for us over the next few verses. And he says this, talking about Jesus or talking about this Messiah. It says this, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a, a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty, no majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. We rejected him because we were looking for a different kind of Messiah. We, we were looking for some, a, a Messiah that would knock out the Romans, deal with COVID, deal with the inflation. We need somebody to come and rescue us. Now, we were looking for somebody powerful enough to deal with what's going on in our life. We didn't just want somebody who wandered around in the wilderness who had a ragtag bunch of followers he, he wasn't even a Pharisee. He wasn't even a priest. He wasn't anybody special. Ma matter of fact, Isaiah said, he came from a, a disreputable background. He, he grew up before him like a tender shoot. You know what that word is? It, it, the word is actually like sucker branches. It's like those little, those little branches that grow off the side of a, the trunk of a tree or a major limb of a tree or grow up out of the roots of the ground that, that you just, they're always in the way. And you, you always, they're always, people are tripping over them. We, we saw Jesus as the sucker branch. He, he wasn't any, he wasn't some glorious plant, some flourishing plant, somebody that was producing something magnificent in our eyes. All, all he was was a sucker branch. You know what you do with those? You whack them off. 
That's all he was. And remember in Mark chapter 6 when the, when the Jews recognized Jesus? You know what they said about him? Isn't he just the carpenter's son? That's all he is. Isaiah said he, he had a shameful-looking appearance. Like he wasn't dignified or majestic. He didn't have a halo. Didn't have a crown. He, he didn't have an angelic white face. There, there was nothing majestic about him. He, he looked like everybody else. There was nothing in his appearance that was attractive. Remember what they said about him? Can anything good come out of Galilee? We, we know his parents. They're a bunch of nobodies from Nazareth. Look at verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people would hide their face because he, he was despised. That's two times now it says he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. There's nothing remarkable about him, about his life, about his friends. No one would ever associate him to be some kind of king. There's a word, it's the word banish. It's the word men of rank. He was despised by men of rank. The elite, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the temple Rabbis, the rulers, the high priests, the whole temple elite said that his power, the power that he had, must have, come in, must have come from Satan. So they killed him. Then they started to kill his followers. He, he was despicable to them. The, the kind where you turn your face away. The, the language in Hebrew is, means he was really just non-existent. Like, that's the ultimate slam on somebody. You don't even matter. You don't even exist. Some people in our world don't even want to think about Jesus. Can, can you imagine the day when that realization hits them and they realize what and who Jesus is? Because at some point, everyone is going to confess their thoughts of Jesus. In Isaiah 53, we see Jesus as this scorned slave. It's a great word, scorned. But he, he's also this substitute slave. Like the first three verses describe Jesus in, in retrospect, their retro, in retrospect of their view of Jesus. But in verse 4, it starts to affirm how they see him in their hour of need, in their hour of salvation. Notice what it says. It says, this, Surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, afflicted. We, we thought he was an imposter. We thought he was a liar. We, we thought his power was actually satanic, not from God. We, we thought God was actually killing a blasphemer. The Jews thought God was using them to use the Romans to, to execute the plan that God had and put in place. But, but if you look and if you know, Jesus didn't die for his sins because he had none. He didn't die for his iniquities. But notice verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. Crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought you and I peace and hope and all of those things was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. And the real, that, that aha moment, that realization begins to set in that Jesus is, is actually our substitute. It was our sins that he was bearing. It was our transgressions and our iniquities and our griefs and our sorrows and our burdens that he's carrying, he took my place, he took your place. He, he's actually my substitute for every, for every slip of my tongue, for, for every evil intent, for every careless look, for every misplaced thought. Listen, how, how can God be compassionate and forgiving and at the same time never look past any sin? 
No, someone's going to have to pay. People aren't going to get away with it. No one's going to get away with anything. See, the answer to the riddle in the Old Testament is that God gives grace to those people who repent, those people who believe, those people who confess, and he, and he punishes his son in the place of the sinner. Have you thought about that? He bore our sin. He carried our shame. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that you and I deserved, it fell on Jesus. And by his scourging, you and I are spiritually healed. See, the Jews thought God was just getting rid of a blasphemer, but God was using the Jews to put a Savior on a cross to bear our sins. And he was pierced and crushed for our transgressions, for our violations, for our our perversions, but also for our well-being and also for our spiritual healing. And, And listen, that's the same perspective that every single one of us needs to have when we come to the cross, that Jesus is our substitute. Look at verse 6. We all like sheep. Have, have gone astray, and each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isn't that what sheep do? We, we go astray. We wander away from God. We wander away from his will. We wander away from his plan because we don't trust it. So Christ had to die. And God treated him as if he had committed every sin committed by every single person who's ever lived in the history of the world. Yet Jesus committed none of them. And God treated him as if he had committed all of them. And God punished Jesus for all of that sin. Jesus was this scorned slave. He was our substitute slave. But he's also the submissive slave. In verse 7, we come to the trial that Jesus endured. And it says this, he was oppressed. That's a legal term. He he was afflicted. In in Hebrew, literally, he, he he allowed himself to be abused. But yet, it says, he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. He didn't open his mouth. Jesus goes on trial, and he said nothing. He didn't speak. He didn't defend himself. He was like a lamb being led to the slaughter. Remember what John the Baptist said about him? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away, yet... Who of his generation protested? No one stood up and tried to stop the crucifixion. He allowed himself to be beaten and abused and scourged, a punishment that was intended for all people everywhere. His trial moved quickly from oppression to judgment. He was taken away where he was killed. Notice what it says in verse 8. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. And then then we we get to his burial and then his resurrection. It says this in verse 9. He he was assigned a grave with the wicked. You, You realize he was supposed to be thrown outside the walls in a place in the city dump called Gehenna. Outside the walls of Jerusalem where they threw the criminals who had been executed, who passed away, they just threw their body into this burning trash in the city of Jerusalem. They were just discarded, no no longer to be thought of. But something happened in verse 8, verse 9. It says this, And with the rich in his death, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. That rich man would be Joseph of Arimathea. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Something, something has changed in, the, in, this, in between these verses. The momentum begins to shift and to swing into an upward trajectory. Why, 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 does God, why does Jesus not end up in the grave of criminals? In the fires of Gehenna? Because his heavenly father wasn't going to let that happen. And Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. That, that's Jesus and all the details of God's plan on our behalf. 
Jesus is also the satisfying servant. Verse 10 says this. This is a hard verse. As a dad, the Lord was pleased to crush him. Not, not that the Lord was pleased in the agony that his son went through, but the Lord was pleased in what was accomplished through his death. He, he was pleased to crush him, to put him to death, because Jesus would render himself as this guilt offering, as this, the, Bible, the biblical word would be propitiation or expiation. He, he also became the satisfaction of God. God selected his own lamb, his own son, and offered him as this guilt offering so that whoever would choose to believe in Jesus, and in one little short step up from the burning fires of Gehenna to the, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, three days later, the resurrection takes place. And it's implied in verse 10. He will see his offspring. He, he, he will see his offspring. You know what that means? Listen, as a, as a father, John talked about his grandchild. I'm going to talk about mine. As a father of four boys who are married to four beautiful girls who love those girls and who love their mother, I have one grandchild. I'll get to see him this week. And I, I would really love to see the rest of my offspring grow old. I, I would love to see the next generation of Valley View grow old based on what we are producing. I, I would love to see what the Lord does in the lives of all those young people who are going to camp this week. I, I pray for my sons. I pray for their, their wives. I pray for their families. I would love to be around to help them enjoy what the Lord will do over the next several generations. But I won't get to see that because I won't be here. But in the case of Jesus, God says he gets to see his offspring because of the resurrection. And notice verse 10, it says this, he will see his offspring and he will prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. God's plan is going to shift from the darkness of death to the glory of the resurrection. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and he will be satisfied, full satisfaction. God is going to be completely satisfied with what Jesus has done. And then the end of the chapter is going to come directly from God himself. Because all of a sudden we're done hearing from this future people who are confessing some things about what they have seen. And God begins to speak. And he says this, by his knowledge or knowledge of, of him, my righteous servant will justify many and will bear their iniquities. This is God affirming that justification is going to come through his righteous son, through his servant. That justice, justification comes when you know Jesus. You, when, when you know Jesus, when you think about him and what you think about him, that, that's the only way for you and I to be made right with God. So here's the answer to the question, how can a sinner be made right with God? You can only be made right with God through the knowledge of the Son, the Messiah, the one who bears your name. Don't, don't get me wrong. God loves everyone. But God doesn't save everyone that he loves. I'll let that sink in. He doesn't. He didn't even save his son, the one that he loves, from difficulty and death. And God says this about Jesus in verse 12. Therefore, I, I will give him a portion among the great, and Jesus will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for those trans transgressors. That's an amazing, amazing verse. Because God the Father is now satisfied with the sacrifice of his son on a cross for sinners. God also affirms those of us who trust in the plan that he has. Who are, who are making this incredible confession. While you and I look back on the crucifixion, 
it's a confession that we need to make that leads us to salvation. And that confession that every sinner has to make will be saved when they choose to know Jesus. Listen, he's the very one. He's the very one who went from heaven to earth back to heaven. Listen, as you and I begin to look at that very same cross, when I call out to him, when I believe in him, when I turn from my sin, when I unite myself with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection in the waters of baptism, when I embrace him as my Lord and Savior, when I trust his plan, Jesus substitutes my dead life with his great life. And you know the amazing thing? I get a calling friend. I get a calling friend. Friends, listen. We don't think about Jesus near enough. Matter of fact, I bet you can go days without thinking of him. Years ago, a young seminary student by the name of Tom was starting his ministry training, four years of training at a seminary that you guys might know. And he tells the story of meeting a, a lady by the name of Mabel. And he, he wrote this. I want to read his words to you because I think they're powerful. He said this, I met Mabel in a state-run convalescent home. It's not a pleasant place, state-run, not private. It's, it's a large understaffed and overfilled with senile and helpless and lonely people who are waiting, just waiting to die. It's always dark inside. It always smells like sickness and death. He said, I, I was supposed to, in my ministry training, I had to choose a ministry, so I chose nursing home to visit. And all four years in, in college, I had to go visit these every week. I would go once or twice a week for four years. It was, it's not the kind of place that you get used to, he said. On this particular day, I was walking in a hallway that I had not visited before. I was looking in vain, he said, for, for someone who was alive enough just to receive a flower and a word of encouragement. That hallway seemed to contain some of the worst cases I've ever seen because they were strapped to a gurney or they were strapped sitting up in a wheelchair looking completely helpless. As I, as I neared the end of the hallway... I saw an old woman who was strapped in her wheelchair, and her face, as I got closer, her face was absolute horrific, horror. The empty stare on her face, the white pupils of her eyes told me that she was blind. The large hearing, over, hearing aid over one of her ears told me that she was almost deaf. One side of her face was completely gone down to the cheekbones, eaten away by cancer. Her nose had been pushed to the side. Her mouth was was fallen in, on one side and distorted by her jaw, she drooled constantly as I looked at her. I was told later that every new nurse that arrives, the supervisor would, would, would be sent, would send the new nurses down to feed this woman because they thought if she, they could stand the sight of her, they could stand the sight of anything in the building. Her name was Mabel. She was 89 years of age. She had been there bedridden, blind, nearly deaf for 25 years. I don't know why I spoke to her, he said. She looked less likely to respond than most of the people that were in that hallway, but I, I put a flower in her hand, and, and I said these words, here's a flower for you, happy Mother's Day. She held the flower up to her face, and she tried to smell it, and then she spoke. Tom said this, her mind was much more clear than her speech. And she said, thank you. It's a lovely flower. But could I give it to someone else? You know, I, I can't see it because I'm blind. And I, I told her, he said, I, of course. And he pushed her chair down the hallway where they found an alert patient. And he said, I stopped the chair. Mabel held out the flower to this other lady and said, here you go. This is from Jesus. Right away, I began, it began to dawn on me that this was no ordinary human being. I, I would later learn her story, her childhood story, that, about her mother passing and her sickness and her blindness and 
her pain and her journey into this home where she'd been. And Mabel and I became quick, quickly became good friends. And once or twice a week for the next three years, I would visit her. Some days I'd read from her Bible. And every time that I would pause, she would finish the verse word for word from verses that she had memorized. Other days I would, I, I would take a, a hymn book with me and we would sing some songs and she would offer some words of encouragement about the words of the song and what it meant that were relevant to her situation. It wasn't long before I, I turned from a sense that I was being helpful to being in awe. My final year of school, during my final exams, I was so frustrated because my mind seemed to be pulled in so many different directions. I, I couldn't think about anything else. There were so many things that I had to think about. And he said, that question haunted me for a little bit because he said, I, I then began to think, what, is, what does Mabel think about all day long? Every hour after hour? Day after day, week after week, month after month. She doesn't even know if it's day or nighttime. So I asked her. I, I drove over and I asked her, Mabel, what do you think about while you're in here? Oh, she said, somewhat of a smile on her face. He said, she said, that's so easy. I think about Jesus. I know, I know the difficulty. Tom said, I know the difficulty I have for me when just to sit for five minutes and think about Jesus. So, so I asked her, what, what do you think about Jesus while you're sitting here? She said these words. I think about how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me, you know. I'm one of those kind of people that's mostly satisfied with life, and lots of people probably could care less about what I think. But I don't care. I just like thinking about Jesus. And then Mabel did something. While Tom in the room, Mabel began to sing this song. I want you to hear it today.
It's no ordinary human being. And those of us who know Jesus are not ordinary either because we have a friend in him. So this morning, I just want to give you an opportunity just to sit still and to think about Jesus. Take some time. We're going to close out our service here in just a moment, but, you know, if you need to, just sit in this room. Ponder your friend and all that he's done for you. Think about him. You wouldn't be where you are today without him. And if you don't know him, if he's not your friend yet, man, talk to us. I'll introduce you to him. I want you to know him. I want you to spend your, di- your life and your time, portions of your day, every moment of your day, thinking about Jesus. Don't waste this summer. Don't waste this time. Spend your day thinking of him. Let me pray. God in heaven, there are so many places where our thoughts land, things that we worry about, things that we get concerned about, God, but your, your plan involves your son, and your son has given his life so that we could have life. So, Father, may may we truly be a people, a church, that thinks about all that your son has done, all that you have done. As you love us, God, yes, but also as you save us, most importantly, through your grace. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for calling us your friend. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mabel. Right, what a great reminder. I hope you take Joe up on it. If you just need to sit and spend some time, do. You know, if you're busy during the week, it's okay. Set some time aside. You will be blessed. Whatever you have, just spend some time with Jesus. He wants to talk to you. If you're visiting, I hope you were blessed by being here today. I hope it was a great experience. We'd love to meet you say hi just outside these doors here in the middle to your right you'll see a glass room it's called the next room stop by let's shake your hand and just say hi to you we'd love to answer any questions you have you want to talk about your next steps if you're leaving today and you want to know there's people in there that'll help you on that path right you can stop if you just need some prayer another good place to stop just stop in let us pray with you if you're online or if you're busy this morning that's okay just text us Tell us you need some prayer. We'll reach out to you. Or you can go to our online ministry, prayer ministry. Just go online. You can actually schedule time. There's so many ways to be surrounded by people that are just like you, just like you. And they just want to share that good news with you, pray with you, help you any way they can. Please do that. And listen, don't forget to mark your calendars for July 16th. That's a Saturday, 1030 in the morning here on campus. Um, We're going to have a family fun day, scavenger hunt, um, some water events, water games, because it's going to be hot. There's going to be pizza, so you got to be here for that, right? It's it's what you want to do. It's $5 a person, $20 for families of four and more. Um, You can register before, I think it's July 1, you're in for a raffle. So make sure you get online early. Go to vbcc.org backslash events and get signed up. God's love is incredible, isn't it? Gosh. We love you, too. Hope you have a good week. Make sure if anyone asks you why you're smiling, you tell them it's Jesus. Have a good week.